verse-by-verse study of this wonderful gospel. Uh, we got through the first 14 verses last week, and so if the Lord wills, we're going to finish it up today as we pick up with verse 15. And today we're going to be talking about backsliding. Favorite subject for most people, isn't it? Backsliding. Uh, there's a local United Way office realized that uh, uh, it was going to do it, some auditing of its records, and they realized that the town's most successful businessman had never made a donation to them. And so they sent out a rep to the guy's house to ask you just maybe possibly it might have been an oversight on his part, you know, to see if he wanted to uh, um, rectify that. And, and so the guy uh, says to him, he says, our research shows that out of a yearly income of at least $500,000, you don't give a penny to charity. Wouldn't you like to give back to the community the same way that's given to you? And so the businessman mulled this over for a second or two, and he said, well, first... Did your research also show that my mother is dying from a long illness and has medical bills that are seven times her income? Um, the guy was pretty embarrassed by that, and so he said, uh, no. And, and he said, or that my brother, a disabled veteran, is blind and confined to a wheelchair? Did it show you that? And the poor dude began to kind of stammer out some sort of an apology but before he could, he was interrupted. The guy said, or that my sister's husband died in an auto accident, leaving her penniless and without, uh, with three children? Well, the United Way rep was just totally humili uh, humiliated, completely beaten. And he simply said, I had no idea. Well, the businessman was on a roll then, and he says, so if I don't give any money to them, why should I give any money to you? You know, it's pretty sickening when we see the world act that way, and we do. We see that quite a bit. Uh, but it's really pathetic when we see uh, Christians do that. And, and uh, you know, today we're going to be looking at uh, Peter and his uh, uh, fulfillment of prophecy when Jesus said that before the day was over, he was going to deny him three times. And so we left off with Jesus. He had been arrested or more properly, surrendered himself to the authorities in the garden. And they had taken him away to the, uh, uh, where the priest hung out for his uh, kangaroo trial. And says, uh, Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the, high, to the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. In Luke's account, he says that Peter followed, but he followed from a distance. You know, he didn't want to get too close, so he was, he was following from a distance. And where it says the other disciple, this is, this is John. Uh, I've read some commentators that think that it might have been Nicodemus, but it, uh, it, it wasn't Nicodemus. Uh, it, it was uh, John for some reason. The, the suspicion is that maybe his family, because he was a fisherman, his dad, Zebedee, had a big fishing business up in Galilee, and the uh, uh, guess is that they had some sort of a uh, uh, business with the, with the temple where they were providing dried fish uh, and... and um, uh, so John was therefore known. And because the reason why we believe it's John is because he never speaks of himself by name in the book. The only time you see the name John in the Gospel of John is when it's talking about John the Baptist. And uh, so he says, uh, uh, and so he went and spoke to this gal and, uh, about Peter, and then she let him in. And so the gal who kept the door said to Peter, you're not also with this man's disciple, are you? Uh, and this is why I don't think it was Nicodemus, because he was still kind of undercover at this time, you know, and he wouldn't have been known as one of the Lord's disciples. He didn't really come out uh, uh, about being the Lord's disciple until after the Lord, Jesus was crucified. Um, but uh, she said, you're not one of his disciples too, like John is, are you? Is it effectively what she was asking. And he says, I am not denial number one. I, I don't, what do you, when, G, when Peter did this, when he says, I am not one of his disciples, knowing that, I mean, it, it's not like it had been a couple of months earlier that Jesus predicted that he would deny him three times. It hadn't even been a few days earlier. It had only been a couple hours. You know, it was just, just a few short hours earlier 
right before they had got to the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus had predicted this. I, 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 what, what do you think? What, did John, Peter know? Oh, gosh, I just denied Jesus the first of three times. Or did he have some sort of, like, unsettled feeling in, down inside that just something wasn't quite right? Or verse 18 says, and Now the servants and the officers who had made a fire of coal there fire at coals for it was cold they warned themselves and Peter stood with them and warned himself and the high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine you know he asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine what is your doctrine are you a Baptist or a Pentecostal you know I don't I mean what was the, the doctrine just means teaching you know they were just saying what is your teaching what 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 what's what have you been teaching that would have made us arrest you for being a false teacher uh, is uh, effectively what they were asking. And Jesus answered him. He says, I spoke openly to the world. I've always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I've said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I have said to them. Indeed, they know what I've said. What Jesus was saying here effectively, essentially was just saying uh, in accordance with the law, you know, a person couldn't be asked to testify against themselves or, or their testimony on their own behalf really wasn't valid. It was, the thing was established on the testimony of two or three witnesses. So the, for them to establish anything, they had to go ask the people that would have heard him say these things. And he was just basically saying, why don't you follow what the law says? Uh, everything I've done has been in the light of day. Just go talk to some of the people that, that uh, I've talked to, and that'll give... Um, You'll get your answer. And just like we have in the United States where uh, in our jurisprudence, a man can't be forced to testify against himself. He couldn't do that in, in, uh, under Jewish law either. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand saying, you answer the high priest like that? And Jesus answered him and said, if I've spoken evil, bear witness of that evil. Tell me, if I've said something wrong, tell me what I said wrong. But if I've spoken the truth, if I've spoken well, then why do you strike me? <laughs> Damien, you know, you just, you, you, how can you speak to the high priest that way? Damien Kyle, Calvary Chapel Modesto says, high priest, high schmeast. Who cares about that? You've got God in your midst and you just hit him in the face. You know, they were all worried about that and they had just struck their own creator. And I mean, it wasn't some like, Will Smith girly slap either, you know, I mean, it was just, it was like, uh, I mean, in fact, the, the word, it was a full-on sucker punch. The word here uh, in the original language is darrow, and it means to flay or to scourge or to thrash. I mean, it was only one punch, but it was the first of what the, the guy was hoping would have been many, you know, I mean, he was, he was ready to give Jesus a thrashing just because he spoke. So then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest, probably in the same complex down there at the, the, be the southwestern corner of the, of the Temple Mount. Uh, it was probably just a, you know, they didn't, they didn't cart him off across town. They were probably just a, uh, a few yards apart from each other. But he sent him from his residence over to uh, Caiaphas, his, his son-in-law's, and uh, it says Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. And therefore they said to him, are you not also one of his, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. Denial number two. You would think by now, Peter would be definitely scoping back to what he had said a few hours ago. Lord, everybody else might deny you. Everybody else might turn their back on you. Everybody else may betray you, but I never will. You can count on me because I am your number one disciple. You'd think he would have remembered making that brash statement, wouldn't you? He, he, he said, and in fact, the New King James puts an exclamation mark on it. I am not one of his disciples. And so then one of the servants, or I'm sorry, one of the servants, the high priest, the relative of him who whose ear Peter cut off. So this is, one, this is Malchus's cousin or uncle or somebody. It's a re, he's a relative of Malchus. Uh, and he said to him, didn't I see you in the garden? He goes, wait a minute. 
ain't you the guy that swings the sword like a girl? You know, because he was trying to chop off his head, and he ended up chopping off his ear instead. And he said, I, I remember seeing you across the valley over there when we were uh, in the, in the, on the Mount of Olives. He says, you, you are one of his guys, because I saw you there. And then Peter again denied it, and immediately the rooster crowed. In Luke's account, in Luke chapter 22, where it gives this account of Peter's denial, it says, starting with verse 61, and when he denied him after that third time, it says, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And the, he looked at Peter, and Peter remembered, and then he remembered when the Lord turned and looked at him. In fact, the word look here, it's, it's emblepo, which means uh, to look in or to look into. You know, it's, it's not like the Lord just turned around and said, Pete, what are you doing, man? It, it wasn't that. Je I mean, we don't know the geography of the situation, but when this happened, he was in eyesight of Jesus. And Jesus turned around and looked at him. And he looked, didn't look at him, he looked in him. It, 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 he, he did what I call the Jesus look. You know, it's the look that, that goes to the eyeballs uh, goes in, through the iris and then bounces off the back of the retina and then just goes down into the soul. It's, it's not a look of condemnation. It may not even be a, a look of pain or, or hurt. But it, but it, was, it certainly was a look of knowing. Is that, that Jesus looked at Peter and, and there were, there were no, no games, no scams, no excuses, no, uh, I mean, there was nothing that Peter could say because Jesus knew. He, he knew everything about Peter. And, and, and then Peter remembered what had happened just a few hours earlier. <clears throat> you know, there's a line to a song that says, everyone's a Judas when the truth is finally known. And when we stop and think about it, we think of uh, what Peter had done here, and we lay it alongside what Judas had done. The difference between the two is quantitative, not qualitative. It's of the same quality. There's, there's really, in essence, no difference between Peter's denial and uh, Judas's denial. There's no difference between Judas's betrayal and Peter's betrayal. Maybe, may, maybe in, in quantity but not in kind. But the difference, because, because the, the simil, there's the, okay, that's the similarity between the two, but the difference between the two is going to uh, manifest itself very quickly in, it's, it's going to be shown in not so much their failure, not so much their sin, because everyone's a Judas when the truth is finally known. You know, every one of us, everybody here this morning, has denied Jesus at some point, in some way, some fashion. And just the fact that we haven't said, I'm not one of his disciples, real out loud, doesn't mean we haven't denied him. We, we, we've all done that. So, but God, I don't think, is so concerned with our failures, the, 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 the times when we fail him, as he is concerned with what we do with our failures. What do we do when we have failed him? How do we, how, how do we respond to that? And that's going to be the difference between uh, Peter's failure and Judas's. And so they led Jesus from uh, Caiaphas to the praetorium, and it was early morning, and they themselves did not go into the praetorium lest they should be defiled, but they, uh, that they might eat the Passover. Uh, Praetorium, if you're reading from the Old King James, it says Hall of Judgment. And it was up there in the Antonia Fortress. I, I, I know I said last week I called it the Herodia Fortress. And as the words were coming out of my mouth, I knew that wasn't right. But it's, the, it's up in the northwestern corner of the temple. Uh, and uh, where they, they went from the southwestern corner to the northwestern corner of the Temple Mount uh, to this fortress that was kind of like the Roman headquarters when, when they would have a detachment of soldiers there. And, and uh, Pilate normally hung out at Caesarea by the sea, uh, about 30 or 40 miles away from Jerusalem. Uh, but, you know, when there's something like the Passover going on or, or something, he would have to go and, and put up with all of the heat and the combustion and, 
and uh, congestion of, uh, and the hustle and bustle of Jerusalem, and he would stay at um, the Antonia Fortress when he did so. So they take Jesus up there, and, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, the Synoptic Gospels focus, they emphasize Jesus' trial before the Jews, you know, before uh, Caiaphas and Annas. Um, and so they, they cover that pretty well. But John's emphasis is going to be more, the focus is going to be more of what happens here. And he actually appears before Pilate on two occasions uh, this, uh, on this night. And that's where John's focus is going to be, is the trial before Pilate. Now, there might be some confusion because it says they didn't want to, the, the uh, Jewish leadership, the, the Sanhedrin, didn't want to become defiled so in order that would prevent them from eating the Passover. Didn't Jesus and his disciples just eat the Passover the night before? So why would they be wanting to eat the Passover, the Sanhedrin wanting to be eat the uh, Passover the day after? There's two possible explanations to this. One is that there were two ways of determining when the Passover was. There was a Galilean way and there was a Judean way of doing it. And it, it was just, they would, you know, determining when the full moon was and everything. And, and it, it, it just, it was, uh, uh, they were just, it wasn't set in stone. That's, and then they would be one day apart. Uh, that's one way of thinking it. Uh, but I think maybe more properly is if in Leviticus it talks about the Passover, and this was the, the night that they would eat the Passover lamb and they would eat the uh, unleavened bread. And then uh, the next day began seven days of what was called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So they'd had Passover, and then the next day would be the first of seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And they were two different observances, but because they were just like, like this, they kind of became melded <clears throat> together in some people's minds and it would just sometimes be called the, the week of Passover or the week of unleavened bread either way and so it could have been something like that uh, but you know that's not what that's not the thing that do you, is anyone bothered by the duplicity here I mean here are these guys you know they, they were they were they were violating their own law on so many levels I mean here these guys were the teachers of the law they were the ones that stood before the entire nation and said, this is what Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy says. And they were breaking it on so many levels. I mean, they, they were concerned about, if they went into the Praetorium, which was all Gentiles, and the Gentiles didn't eat unleavened bread, you know, they, I mean, they were full on wonder bread and, and everything about it, you know, and, and uh, there, could be, there, there could be some, uh, uh, some wonder bread crumbs on the floor inside the praetorium and one of the members of the Sanhedrin could step on it and get that little leaven dust stuck on their sandal and then take it back to their house and then it would fall off of their sandal in their house and that would make the whole house defiled and they wouldn't be able to eat the Passover that way. So they, were, they didn't want to get any Gentile dust on them. So they told Pilate, we can't come into your house. You're going to have to come out to us because we keep the law. And, and yet they were hell-bent on executing an innocent man. Is, is there some duplicity here, you think? Uh, I, it just kind of, to me, it just sort of uh, not only demonstrates but underscores. It, it emphasizes the blinding power of religion. You know, we can get so caught up in the externals that we lose the essence of what the externals are supposed to be all about. And that's what happened to, to, to the Jewish leadership. So, you know, Pilate had already had a couple of strikes against him in Rome concerning the Jews, so he was kind of willing to bend a little bit their way. And so he went out to them, says in verse 29, and he said, what accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered and said to him, well, if you were not an evildoer, we wouldn't have delivered him to you. You know, so, so Pilate is saying, why have you arrested this guy? And their answer is, because he's a bad guy. And then Pilate said, well, how do you know he's a bad guy? And he said, because we arrested him. You know, I mean, that's, that's the way they were kind of, they were responding to this. 
And in, in Luke's account, in Luke chapter 23, they do, he, they do list three, the three charges that they brought to Pilate against Jesus. They, they were a little more explicit than just simply said, you know, he's a bad guy. That's why we arrest, we arrest bad guys. Um, they, they, first of all, they said that he was guilty of sedition. In other words, he was trying to uh, cause a rebellion, trying to usurp the authority uh, of Rome and thought that would get the Romans' attention. Second thing they said is that he was very anti-taxes. He says, he says he's trying to teach all the people to don't pay taxes to Rome. And if anything would get Rome's attention, it would be that. Uh, and then the third thing they said is, and he also claims to be a god, which in, in that time in the first century in the Roman Empire, uh, people would, would swear allegiance to Caesar, and they would burn incense to him, and that was in essence worshiping him, and wor Caesar was declared to be a god. When, when a man would become a Caesar, then he would be elevated to the point of deity. And so for uh, Jesus to say that he was a god would be kind of like trying to put himself above Caesar. And so they, they, those, those three charges, they thought surely would get Pilate to say, you know, off with his head or whatever, whatever they were going to do as a means of execution. Well, uh, you know, he, 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 wasn't, he, he, didn't, he wasn't trying to lead rebellion against Rome. And you can go ask any of the people that listened to him taught, and he told them all to be good Roman citizens. You read any of the epistles of the New Testament, and they're supposed to be good citizens under the king. He certainly wasn't, I mean, they, they, they knew that their charge about him being against taxes was a bold-faced, audaciously flat-out, shame-faced violation of the Ninth Commandment. I mean, commandment. Uh, they were bearing false witness against their neighbor. Jesus didn't do that, and they knew he didn't do that. And, and even the charge that he claims to be, a God, or to be a God wasn't fully true. I mean, Jesus did claim to be God, but he wasn't a God. He is, he is the God, the king. So Pilate said to them, verse 31, You take him and judge him according to your law. And the Jews said to him, It's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. In Genesis, in, in the Old Testament, would be, that would have been the Bible that the Sanhedrin would, was following. In the first book, Genesis chapter 49, there's a prophecy given, uh, Genesis 49.10, that the scepter shall not depart from Judah or nor a lawgiver giver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. Now, <clears throat> many, many interpreters in that day, even from some time after that, saw this as being, uh, many Jewish uh, rabbis and, and, and scribes saw this as being a prophecy for the Messiah. Uh, in fact, uh, there, there were uh, some paraphrases of the uh, Old Testament that had come into being uh, by this time uh, that were, they were kind of like, more like commentaries, but, but it was kind of, it's kind of like the living Bible or, or maybe more like the message. You know, it was very, there's a lot of commentary involved in it. But in, in the Targum Jonathan of Genesis 49, 10, it says, Kings shall not cease, nor rulers from the house of Yehuda, which is Judah, nor the Sepharim, which is the scribes or the, or the teachers. The, the, the teacher's teaching, the, the law from his seed till the time uh, of King Mashiach, that's the Messiah, shall come. So in Targum Jonathan, they were saying that the, 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 the kingdom of Judah will not cease to be until the Messiah is manifested. That's basically what Genesis 49.10 is saying. And that's the way it was uh, traditionally understood up until the early centuries of the, of the church. Now, the law of the right of capital punishment had been taken away from the Jews. That's why the Jews said to Pilate, uh, he's guilty of, of a capital crime and we can't exercise that. We can't uh, uh, sentence somebody to death because that's been taken away from. According to the, the, the Talmud, which was written a few hundred years after this, uh, but it says that that was done around 28 AD, which would be a few years prior to this. 
but there's uh, some of the writers that, that I, uh, I read said that it was, there was a, a Roman governor right after the death of Herod the Great uh, that a Roman governor came in and he took the right, after Herod's death, he took the, Herod had the right of capital punishment. He was, he was the only uh, person in Judea that was, uh, could have the title of king. Caesar let him have the title of king. Uh, and after he died, they, then they didn't have that title anymore, officially. And the first Roman governor that came in to replace Herod was a guy by the name of Cap, uh, Caponius. And it's around 6 AD that he took away the right of capital punishment. Which, interestingly enough, is right about, we're not, we, you know, the dates are a little fuzzy. They're, so, they're just not able to tell for sure. But that 6 AD was right about the time Jesus appeared in the temple when he was teaching the rabbis and his mom and dad lost him and they went looking for him, found him in the temple. And they said, like, what are you doing here? And he said, don't you know that I should be about my father's business? That's right about that time. Now, what's significant about this is that when the right of capital punishment was taken away from the Jews... The rabbis, the, 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 the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the leadership had all believed that Genesis 49.10 had been broken. They believed that the, the, the scepter had been taken away from Judah. That they believed that there would always be a lawgiver, uh, there would always be a king that would come from Judah's loins that always sat on the throne. And, and then that right, and the right of capital punishment is the sign of sovereignty. You know, I mean, that's, you know, you have that right. That's the, you, not much greater right than that to have the power of life and death over somebody. And, and so they believed that that had been broken. And they went through the streets of Jerusalem wailing, believing that the law wasn't true. The Genesis, was, it wasn't the word of God because he had prophesied it and it didn't happen. And yet, as that was happening, I believe, this is my own warped opinion, but as that was happening, Jesus was in the temple astounding the rabbis with his insight into the scriptures that he had actually written before he was incarnated. Pretty cool. Therefore, the Jews said to him, it is unlawful for us to put anyone to death, and that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying what death he would die. Uh, you know, <clears throat> what John's saying is we'd have to uh, back all the way back up uh, to chapter 3, which was, we, that was a couple of weeks ago when we were back in chapter 3, and uh, when he, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and he says, starting in verse 14, and Moses, as Moses lifted up uh, the serpent in the wilderness, he's explaining to what, how, what the role of the Messiah was going to be to Nicodemus. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And that's what Jesus explained to Nicodemus. That in the Old Testament, in the book of Numbers, they, uh, they had been complaining when they were wandering around in the wilderness. They'd been complaining to God about stuff. And so God, trying to get their attention, he allowed these, they call them fiery serpents, which means poisonous snakes, had come into the, in, into the camp. And they were biting the people, and the people were dying from the snake bite. And because and they, they weren't Pentecostals from... Tennessee, so they didn't know how to handle them, and 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 so, so uh, they were they were dying from snake bites, and and so they went to Moses and they said, Moses, man, we messed up. We're sorry. Please go ask God to forgive us. So Moses uh, took it to the Lord, and the Lord says, Okay, I forgive him. Um, and so here's what you do. I want you to take some bronze, some brass, and make a standard, a pole, and wrap a snake around it to symbolize these these serpents, and then hold it up before the people, and anybody that looks at it they'll get healed from their snake bites. And Moses was kind of thinking, that's it? You, you want me to do what? And, and God said, take a pole, wrap a snake around it, hold it up for the people. And anybody that looks at it will get healed from snake bites. So he did, and they did. And, and they, had to, they had to, but here's the thing, just lifting up the serpent didn't heal anybody. Just lifting up that standard didn't exact the healing. They had to look at it. They had to look at it believing that by looking at it, they would receive their healing. They had to look at it, we could say, by faith. They had to look at it trusting that by looking at this standard with a snake on it, I'll be healed of my snake bite. 
And I can imagine, I mean, I just, because this is the way my brain works, I can imagine there were a lot of people in the camp. I mean, I mean this, we'd start off with somewhere in the neighborhood of four or five million people, okay? And, and there's a lot of people that are just, you can imagine all the people laying around moaning and crying and hurting because they're snake biting, and their limbs are all swelling up and everything. And their neighbor comes running up and says, guess what? The Lord has brought healing. We don't have to die of our snake bites. He said, great, how you do it? He says, just turn around and look at that standard over there. And the guy would go, what? He said, yeah, just, just if you look at that standard, you'll be healed. And the person's saying, seriously? Yeah, look, I, I got healed. Look, look at the standard, turn around and look at that snake by faith, and you'll be healed. And I could see their response like, Oh, only hypocrites turn around and look. Or, I'll, I'll turn around and look at it someday. I'm not done enjoying my snake bite yet. So I'm, I'm going <laughs> to, once I get tired of this, then maybe I'll turn around and look. You know, I'm going to just enjoy my snake bite while I'm young. When I'm too old to enjoy snake bites anymore, then maybe I'll look. Or, would you stop trying to cram your snake bite cure down my throat? <laughs> you can imagine some of the responses that people had. So Jesus, so Jesus says to Nicodemus, in the same way that Moses lifted up the standard in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And then whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Followed by the most universally well-known verse in the entire world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever would believe on him would not perish but have eternal life. Well, Pilate entered, this is verse 33, Pilate entered the praetorium again, and he called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself? Or did others tell you this concerning me? Why are you asking me, Pilate? I mean, are, are you wanting to, are you, are you saying, can, you know, could you tell me how to get saved? Or did somebody tell you to ask that of me? And I, I think that was a s sincere question on Jesus' part. I don't think he was trying to be coy or anything like that. I think he was, he was really kind of trying to draw Pilate in here. And, and, and Pilate answered and said, Am I a Jew? Your own nations and the chief priests delivered you to me. What, what have you done? I mean, you know, you're going to have to explain to me why you're here. Your authorities have arrested you. And so I want you to tell me why. And so he said... You know, this is my question. He said, well, well, why did they, th these are the charges they brought you, against you, uh, sedition, anti-taxes, and claiming to be a king. He answered and said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. When he says my kingdom is not of this world, uh, it literally it's uh, the, the word of here is the Greek word for out from or out of. He says my kingdom is not out of this world. It didn't come out of the world. My, my kingdom is not part of the world. The, the cosmos, the, the world system. Remember, it's that world system that is set up as independent from God. My kingdom is not part of this system that is independent of God. It's completely different. It, it, it doesn't have its source in that. It doesn't originate in that. It's, it's different. And if it were, if it were of this world, all I'd have to do is snap my fingers and all of my servants, all of the disciples that have uh, chosen to follow me would come. In fact, I'd snap my fingers twice and you'd have some servants that you ain't seen show up, some heavenly ones. So Pilate said in verse 37, so you're saying you are a king then. You know, this is all going totally over uh, Pilate's pagan head. And, and he, he says, so you're admitting it then, you are a king. And, and Jesus says, and no, the, see the word rightly here in the New King James is in italics. He says, you say that I'm a king. You're saying it. In, in other words, the word rightly is, is rightly there, uh, but it's not in the original language. Pilate, he, Jesus is saying to Pilate, you're, you're, you're the one that's saying it. You're claiming that I'm a king. And, and yeah, you are affirming that for me. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I've come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. 
and everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. You know, we live in a day in which the subject of truth has become very subjective. You know, the truth, what, what, and Pilate's going to say, what is truth? You know, and it's just, it, that's, that's the mantra of our era. You know, it just, it's like, how can anybody know what's right or wrong? I've got my truth. You got your truth. There is no right. There is no wrong. It's just everybody to thine own self be true. Everybody has to just follow their own uh, dream and go for it. And, and, and that's good enough. There's a Greek word for that. Hogwash eats of mine. Okay, it, 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 it is not in the Bible. I mean, no, the, Bible, the Bible teaches that we, anyone who wants to know truth, if you genuinely want to know the truth, guess what? You'll find it. I mean, it, it's there. It, tr truth is not subjective, it's objective. It can be known. Truth can be known. You, you can know right from wrong. You can know if you do a certain thing, a certain thing will be the consequence. You, can, you know you can know that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not subjective at all. But the, the problem becomes when we, the re, the, we can miss the truth. We can say that, that we want truth. We can say that we're searching out our own truth. And in so doing that, when we say that we want our truth, not the truth, yeah, we say that we want our truth, not his truth, then we, we begin compromising, we, we start making excuses for our behavior, uh, we start you know, pointing the blame at other people, and all these sort of things kind of become our truth. That becomes our reality, when in, in, in truth, that's the truth of our making. You know, by our compromises and our finger pointing, then, that, then we are creating our own truth, which you can't do. You know, if, if you think that's true, then just declare that the law of gravity is not true and jump off a cliff and see how good that works for you. You know, there is truth. And we're not the originator of it. And so he, he says, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate says, what is truth? And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know how he said that. I mean, was, was he turning away from Jesus and throwing his hands in the air at that po uh, point? Was he looking right at him when he said it? When, when Jesus said, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice, and Pilate just looked at him and said, what is truth? W was it said that, you know, we don't have the MP3 of it, so we don't know exactly what the voice inflection that he had uh, was. But when he had said this, and it kind of makes me think that he was, did it the first way. He's just walking away and threw his hands in the air. You know, what is truth? Just kind of dismissively, because it says when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I don't find a fault in this guy. I, I do not know why you brought him here. I've examined him. I don't see anything rebellious about him. Revolutionary, yes, but not rebellious. I certainly don't see how you could charge him with being anti-taxes to Caesar. And his claim to be a king, you know, it it's, it's doesn't have any threat to Caesar. It doesn't have any threat to uh, the powers of Rome. So why have you brought this guy to me? I find no fault in him. And thinking that he had found a loophole in all this, because, see, he, like I said, he's already got two strikes against him. He's done some things with the Jews up to this point that's gotten back to Rome, and Rome has kind of told Pilate, don't mess up. That's a hard place to keep happy. Don't make them upset anymore. And, and, and so he thinks, I know what I'll do. I'll, here's my, here's my get-out-of-jail-free card here. Here's how I can satisfy them and at the same time not kill this innocent man. By the way, his wife... Pilate's wife had come to him that day when all this was going on and said, don't have anything to do with this guy. Don't, don't mess up because I had a dream last night about this guy and I don't think it's going to be good for you if you do what the Jews are telling you to do. Have nothing to do with this. And so, you know, he's got this going on in the back of his brain too. 
And so he says, okay, it's Passover. You guys have this custom that we do this. This is, this is because we're Roman. We, we're so nice. So what we do every year at Passover is we let you pick somebody that's in jail and we'll release them. They get, they get out of jail because it's Passover. And, and so uh, you have a custom that I should release, release someone to you at Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And they, you know, thinking that they would say, no, not, uh, don't, I mean, yeah, release him. Don't, don't, because there was two guys in jail right, right then. There was Jesus. And then there was, and they all cried uh, again saying, not this man, but Barabbas. He said, release Barabbas to us. And he, I mean, it's, you know, it says now Barabbas was a robber. Uh, the word robber here is the word lestes, which uh, it, this, it, it's not the normal, the normal word for robber would be kleptic. You know, we talk about somebody being kleptomaniac, which is somebody who, who steals stuff. And that would be the normal word for robber. That's not the word that John uses here. Uh, it wasn't just the normal word for, for somebody who, uh, you know, like, pickpocket or shoplifts or, or even does a B and E kind of thing. No, this was, I mean, this was uh, somebody armed robbery, 1065 sort of stuff. I mean, this, this guy was a bad guy, you know, and he, he, he went around and robbed people at sword point openly in the light of day. And, and, and he, he was all the things that they said Jesus was, this guy was. And so Pilate thinks, you know, they're comparing, and, you know, it's his, his name, Barabbas, Bar-Abbas, means son of the father. Bar is son, and then Abba is the name for father. Uh, and in some, some of the manuscripts actually say his name was Jesus Barabbas. Jesus is son of the father. That's kind of wild. You know, okay, I got Jesus, son of the father, and I got Jesus, son of the father. Which one do you want me to release to you? And they said, oh, the bad guy. Release the bad guy. Keep the good guy. Is that wild or what? He said, no, not this man. Not Jesus, the son of the father. But Barabbas, the murderer, the robber, the terrorist, the insurrectionist. Release him. You know, Pilate had tried very hard through this whole thing to remain neutral. You know, he was heeding his wife. You know, he said, he said Mrs. Pilate, I'm in a, between a rock and a hard place here, and I do what I can, but I just, uh, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to remain neutral. That's what I'm going to do. I'm just not going to take a stand one way or the other because I don't want them to be mad at me. I don't want Rome to be mad at me. I just, I'm, I'm going to be neutral. And he tried to do that. He, you know, he called for the basin and he washed his hands. Like, like that meant he was innocent. <laughs> Everyone's a pilot when the truth is finally known. I, I, I think that, you know, there, there's a point in, in each and every one of our lives where we try to remain neutral, where we try to not ruffle feathers. We try to not take a stand for, we, we think that if we can just be open-minded or ambivalent or non-committal toward Jesus, that that's okay. We're not going to reject Jesus. We're not going to be anti-Jesus, but we just want to keep things cool with Jesus. It didn't work for Pilate. It doesn't work for us either. You know, Jesus said either you're for me or you're against me. I mean, you, we, we have a choice that either we can receive the truth that he came to bring and just as the Moses lifted up the standard in the wilderness, and we can look to him by faith and receive the healing that he gives us by trusting in him, laying our life before him and, and taking the deliverance that he gives and then living in the way that he tells us to live. Or we can try some other way. And any other way is trying to do what Pilate did. Any other way is doing what Peter did. 
Any other way is doing what Judas did. I think his way is better. Don't you? Let's pray. Father, we just, we come before you and we humbly bow in your presence, God. And we just thank you so much. Thank you that uh, all of this, I mean, we hear this, the, the passion story and our hearts break and, and we don't like to hear about the, the beating and, the, and the, just the, the pain and suffering that Jesus went through and, and uh, the messages about it are all too convicting and, and uh, uncomfortable and, and yet at the same time, Lord, it just drips of your love. Um, this shows us the love that you had for God so loved the world that you gave your only begotten son. And, and so, Father, we just, as we stand in humility, that you would go so far that you would turn heaven and earth upside down, that you would defy the laws of physics just to be able to demonstrate your love for us, that you would offer your own son to take our punishment, and that so he would so willingly receive it from his dear beloved father. And we just, we just stand in awe. We stand in awe before you this morning. We thank you for this plan, for this, this uh, solution that you came up, that, you did, uh, that is yours for the sin problem. We thank you for it, Lord. And, and God, we just, we look to your son. We look to him in faith. We take our eyes off the world. As Matt said earlier, it's a Proverbs 3 thing, Lord. We just don't lean on our own understanding, but we acknowledge you in all our ways. And in so doing, we just say thank you because there's nothing else we can do but just give you praise. As we, ask, we say this and we ask this all in Jesus' name, amen.